what was I doing on the weekend that the largest wildfire in British Columbia recorded history started? Snowshoeing, of course. Beautiful British Columbia. for joining us. I'm Scott Montague from Coquitlam Search and Rescue, and I'm forecasting clear skies on both Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. Your cameras and mics are off for the session, but we still want to hear from you. If you have a burning question, throw it in the Q&A box so we can keep track of them and we'll either answer live or online. If you don't want the audience to see your name, just mark the question as anonymous. I'll also be keeping an eye on the chat box and posting links in there as we go. Also encourage you to use the reactions button somewhere around there, uh, if you could, throughout the webinar. Let's try that now. If you've ever had to change your outdoor plans because of dry and hot conditions, let us know with a thumbs up reaction right now. Anyone had to change their, pl their plans? Oh, one, two, three, not too many. So I guess you've probably planned well in advance. That's, a, that's good news. Uh, I also wanna let you know that if you stick around to the end, you'll have a chance to win a giveaway from our sponsor, BrightSource. And no matter what, everyone will get a freebie from our sponsor, FatMap. To get us started, I'd like to welcome the woman who wants to stoke up the fun while still dousing the need for search and rescue in BC, the executive director of Adventure Smart, none other than Sandra Riches. Thank you, Scott. Well, you stoked that fire pretty, pretty confidently. I appreciate that, and our guest does too, but we'll get to our guest shortly as I as I welcome you tonight, I'm really grateful to have you all here this evening. I know summer's kicking off. Uh, it's always not a time we spend indoors in front of a screen. We try to get away from them, but this will allow you to increase your awareness, set yourself up for success, and it will all eventually help you reach your destinations of your wonderful adventures that you have this summer. And just a friendly reminder that destination is always home. We have a lot of adventures along the way. So those peaks and summits are only halfway. Uh, we'd like to talk to you about a few things before we introduce you to our guest this evening. And my focus with the short talk I have with you, the first thing to kick off the webinar is all around incident prevention, personal preparedness, and how we all can collectively, you, myself, Scott, uh, everyone who loves to hang out outside and, and enjoy beautiful British Columbia and anywhere else you're listening from throughout the country or the world, uh, safely so that we can all be prepared and help reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls. In British Columbia, we have 78 search and rescue groups. And on those 78 search and rescue groups, we have 3,400 search and rescue volunteers. They respond to, on average, based on current data, current statistics, um, about 1,500, 1,500 search and rescue calls a year currently. Uh, it's, it's a busy time in BC. We have a lot of active, healthy enthusiasts that love to get outdoors. Some are aware of that personal preparedness and responsibility to recreate responsibly, and others are unaware for whatever reason. And, and that's where we come in. We come in and we're, we're that door that you can knock on and the people that you can reach out to literally to connect with and ask questions. And, and the start of it's tonight. So why don't we get into just a little bit of our information here this evening. Uh, excuse me, it went the other way. Oh, it went right to the end. Ah, oh, there you got to see it all too quickly. Here we go. The three T's, if you've heard about us before, attended any of these webinars, you've heard us talk about these, or it might be an introduction to what we call the trifecta of outdoor safety. This is really what will set you up for success. 
Uh, trip planning is critical for every adventure, no matter how big or small the adventure. Taking the time to do your research, planning it with the groups that you're heading out with, having those conversations pre-trip days before, weeks before. If you happen to be joining a meetup group, I know a lot of that happens now when you meet at a trailhead. Have that discussion at the parking lot, at the vehicles, at the drop-off location, at the trailhead. Make time to discuss the goals of that activity uh, as a group and, and really put your two cents in and, and, and share those, those um, intentions of that outing so that you can all move together safely and, and make it work together. Ideally, it's done before and you're leaving all of this itinerary and detail with an emergency contact. You can try the Adventure Smart app for that. We'll get there in a second. And making sure that all of the details of where you're going, when you're coming back, who's going with you, uh, what you're carrying, your training, your certifications, your abilities, your route, uh, is all a form of this trip plan. You, you've taken the time to check the weather, which we'll talk about a lot tonight, our guest will anyway, uh, and so many other factors. That's a key piece. The training is also another key component to this puzzle and having that training, it could be mentorship. It could be increasing your awareness with our, our programs and our summer series this season. It can also be certification based in skills and season specific. First aid, bushcraft, map and compass. In the winter time, that's avalanche skills training, which does fold into spring and fall. So that training piece is important. Physical training, mental stability and uh, training to make sound decisions while you're out there will really help you manage those situations where you do need to assess risk and manage it safely. Taking those essentials with you is key. Every single time, if our group is 10, we have 10 backpacks full of all the essentials. If it's five of us, there's five backpacks full of all the essentials. And then don't forget those season and sport specific additional pieces. It could be unique to the sport that you're doing uh, or personal, might be medication, glasses to see what you're reading and mapping and uh, information in general. It could be medication. So these three T's are really a big piece. Scott might throw into the chat um, uh, a link that shows a really fun little three to four minute video about our three T's. We made it last year. And if you're interested to watch a little bit more about this, you can watch that. Visit our website, venturesmart.ca, the BC Search and Rescue Association, Outdoor Education, and share that video with your friends so that we can increase this with everyone out there. You can easily quickly scan with your phone this evening, the QR code there on your screen, and that will take you to the Trip Plan app. It's free of charge and available to anyone in Canada. And if my very quick description of what a trip plan looks like, uh, it was confusing or rushed, check the websites as well. And in the app, it will allow you to fill in the fields and you'll be answering the questions that search and rescue want to know the answers to. And then this will just be sent to an emergency contact. It's a great tool. It's, it's awesome. And it's free of charge. I, I can't recommend it enough. In an emergency and in the province of British Columbia, there's 1,500 search and rescue calls a year. And, and the main reasons for those calls, again, everything is tracked. There's data and more data that we get our hands on. We know the top three reasons for search and rescue are injury, getting lost and disoriented, and exceeding one's abilities. Those are the three main reasons for all seasons, actually, and all enthusiasts. We can mitigate those uh, risks and those incidents, um, but accidents do happen. We understand that. And this emergency procedure will help you. So if you can think of the word STOP or this acronym STOP, it will help you understand what you need to do and the responsibility you can take and manage safely in your situation to help you be found faster and in better condition. So the STOP acronym stands for STOP, think, observe, and plan. By you stopping in one location, and not, don't ever go down a creek, a gully, a drainage, a ravine, stay put and stop there. Um, it's much easier for search and rescue volunteers to locate you if you're not moving, if you stay in one location. Think about the area that you're in, think about how you will communicate with search and rescue. Uh, reminder, if you're not sure where, where to call, the number is 911. So you can think about how quickly you will call, make that as soon as possible to emergency personnel, 911. And 
Think about how will anyone know where you are? Absolutely, because you've left a trip plan behind. And you can just start to think about the process, processes of communication, how that will happen, ideally through primary means of communication, spot, in reach, solio. Uh, your cell phone is your secondary means of communication. Now, your observations are critical. Are you in a safe location? That's key. Make sure you're safe and sound, that you can make shelter here. You can be comfortable and safe in this location while you're waiting for search and rescue. And now you get to plan. You're pulling out the essentials from your pack. You're planning how you're going to keep warm and dry, hydrate, um, keep food in your belly, and, and mentally well while you wait. So this, this can really make a difference and reduce the severity of your call by staying put. So the stop, stop acronym is key. Tonight's special guest is definitely special. There's no question about that. And I'm really quite excited to introduce uh, Brett as our guest tonight. He's coming back to us uh, as a guest that we've had in the past. And it's really exciting to, to bring him back and share with you uh, his knowledge, his expertise, and everything that he can share with us tonight. So if I could just get out to another screen, there we go. Uh, a multifaceted meteorologist by trade, but an enthusiastic science communicator by heart. You just wait to hear there's some energy coming your way. With a passion for the natural world and all of life's, life's curiosities, Brett aims to get people interested in all things science related through captivating storytelling and making complex scientific phenomena easy to understand. Well, that will be good for me too, actually. Fire weather forecaster for the BC Wildfire Service, Brett Soderholm is our very special guest. Welcome back for the second time for this event tonight. Get your questions ready because I hopefully you've got a few. He will have the answers. Tonight's session definitely will not disappoint. Welcome, Brett, and thanks again for coming back. Oh, thank you so much, Sandra. Lovely introduction there. I'm so pleased to be back here once again. And uh, to all of you that have taken the time to tune in on this relatively lovely summer evening, happy to have you here. So I'm going to go ahead and going to share my screen momentarily. But I do want you to know that for tonight, because this has a wildfire component, uh, some of the material may be a little bit sensitive. Um, if you yourself have gone through uh, the unfortunate process of needing to evacuate your home, um, or if you know someone that has, I know that this can trigger a lot of emotions. So I just want to be clear about that. I'm not really going to try to go for a lot of flashy images and things here, but just mentioning that it is going to be a sensitive subject. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Just give me one second as I get this going. We're going to pull it up right there. And hopefully you are all good to be able to see my screen <laughs> if everyone wants to confirm, but I think we should be all right there. That should be good. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Again, once again, my name is Brett Soderholm. I'm a meteorologist and a fire weather forecaster with BC Wildfire Service, and I actually forecast for the Prince George Fire Center. Uh, but today, before I begin, I did want to acknowledge that I am incredibly grateful to be joining you today from the traditional territory of the Tanaha, the Sikh, and the Sinai Nations on whose land I respectfully live, work, and play. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about wildfire and especially weather. I mean, I'm a big outdoor guy myself, and I know that when it comes to trip planning for my own adventures, I have a few tricks of the trade that I like to use to keep me safe out there. So I figured, why not? Let's pass this along um, to everyone as best we can. So couple of things here. If you haven't heard of me before, you weren't here last year, or if you just never figured out who I was, well, I'll give you a little bit of context. I think for starters, the easiest way to describe it is that I'm a bit of a weather nerd. So I really can't stress that enough. I've always been passionate about weather. I grew up in Southern Ontario, where we had these booming thunderstorms all the time. And I was more glued to what was going on in the sky during the summer months than what was on TV or my friends that were playing hockey or something like that. I always just wanted to know more about weather. But I'm not not just a meteorologist. I think a lot of people can think that weather nerds only live and breathe weather. But no, I actually am a big rock climber. That's my main thing that I love to do. Hiker, skier, do a bunch of yoga, reading, that whole thing. Uh, but back in the day, I went to McGill University to get my degree, plural, I guess, degrees in atmospheric science. I did a bachelor's and a master's there. And I kind of did a little specialization in what's called mesoscale meteorology, or basically thunderstorms and tornadoes, because that really got me interested as a kid. Um, in a past life, I've worked for two broadcast companies. You can laugh as you've seen fit, but I was definitely at the Weather Network for about five years. And then I switched over to CBC Vancouver to fill in for a maternity leave contract for Johanna Wagstaff. But then eventually, 
contract ended and an opportunity came up for me to put my skills to use in a slightly different way. And uh, I now work for the BC Wildfire Service. And I will say that I am honored, but definitely terrified at the same time. You can see this picture of me here. This was my very first prescribed burn, as it was called, back in May 2021. I had no idea what I was getting into. Don't get me wrong. I, I love fire. I think it is healthy to be doing these planned burns. But you just really can't tell how hot it is until you're actually standing beside it. And then it really puts everything absolutely into perspective. So for this evening, the big focus, of course, is going to be on the way that weather and wildfire interact. But I did want to also just give you a few tips for how to check a forecast, what a forecast actually means by a meteorologist when they're putting it together, and then how to stay safe. And not just from a trip planning perspective, but just in general, as we are in the thick of wildfire season and it is likely to be picking up as time goes on, there are some essential things that you need to remember in order to stay safe throughout this upcoming season and always, frankly, for seasons to come. And then you'll find out how you can reach me. And then, of course, doing that Q&A that Sandra mentioned. So a little bit more context. So I work for the Wildfire Service. What does that actually entail? Well, I do say safety first always because my primary role is to keep all of our crew members and all of our operational staff safe. It always starts with the weather. So I am not a morning person, but in the summertime, I force myself to wake up at about 5.30 and I'm at my computer for six and I have three hours to get a weather briefing together for my entire fire center. I'll talk more about our fire centers in a little bit, but for context, I forecast for the northeastern quadrant um, of the province. So every single day, I put a briefing together. I let the crews and anyone who's tuning in know what are potential hazards for the day. Is it going to be particularly windy? Are are we looking at the potential for lightning, for example, or thunderstorms? Or is it just going to be very, very hot and dry? These are all essential ingredients to fuel fires. And everyone that works in my fire center really wants to know, essentially down to the hour, how are conditions going to change? So it's certainly tricky. It keeps me on my toes. There is definitely no getting bored uh, in this job, but that is definitely my main role. But then as the season gets going, and certainly as we've already seen this year, my other main job is to create forecasts for a specific fire. So whenever we have a wildfire of note, which I will show you in a second, um, that gets a very specific forecaster to write a very specific forecast for that location. They need precise details as to when those winds are going to shift. How is that fire likely to behave in response to these changing weather conditions? Throw in the fact that we get some adverse weather and I have to issue out warnings that get read over the radio for people and crews to be able to stay safe and to take shelter. And then I'm constantly just monitoring changes in our long range trends and our long range patterns. So yeah, it's a pretty busy day. I would say on average, I work about 12 hours most days. I just finished an 11 day rotation. I'm on a day off currently, so I've got a little bit more energy right now. But uh, yeah, it certainly keeps me going. So the overall message here about safety, right? One of the things meteorologists across the country and across the world, we always have the public at heart. So even though I don't necessarily issue warnings for you specifically, unless you're tuning in and work for the wildfire service, there is an agency it is Environment Canada that is charged with doing exactly that. So it has the ability to issue out these warnings that either get pushed to your phone or to your website. I'm sure you've seen them or heard them before, but those really are quite crucial. And throughout this presentation for context, I've got a couple of links here that I'm going to be showing you mid-presentation. And it's also been collected on a PDF or a Word document. And if that interests you to be able to use some of these links for your own benefit, by all means, we'll make that available to you either soonish or at the end of the presentation. It'll be there. But that first link that I was talking about in terms of our Environment Canada weather alerts, I'm just going to shift gears here and bring that one up. They've kind of changed the format of it. But what you can do now is it is a map that essentially allows you to scroll over wherever you happen to be. So today, for example, I am joining you from the Kootenays. And so I can see that where I am presently, there is or there was <laughs> a severe thunderstorm watch. But apparently that just got dropped in real time. Go figure. Um, but if I was over back up hey, to Brent. Prince George. Hello. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know that uh, we're, we're still seeing your presentation. Interesting. Well, that's kind of good to know because I was worried that that might be the case. Give me a second here. Um, I was hoping that this wouldn't actually happen. Let's go and try to do the screen instead. Is this going to be a little bit better for people? Can we now see the screen? <laughs> I, I, can, I can only see the presentation still. That is bizarre. Okay. Um, boop, boop, boop. Doo, doo, doo. Trying now. 
to that Ta-da! Zoom difference. Okay, my goodness. You would think that after all these years of the pandemic that we would have Zoom down pat. We do these practice sessions and things, but apparently it still doesn't want to go. <laughs> Anyways, so as long as you can see it now, this is good. This was all just, I uh, didn't want to waste time on this, but just get used to looking at these weather alerts for where you are. Um, it is kind of important. You can click and change wherever you happen to be. Even if you're not in BC, you can see what's going on across the country. And uh, that's always important to read whatever they have actually in there. But when I go back and I'm going to pivot, hoping that you can also now see this screen. If I'm going to look we at can. our... Good. All right. We got this. We should be clear from now forward. Um, yeah. The main one that I want to talk to you about is our BCWS dashboard. So BC Wildfire Service, this is going to be one of the things that I think everyone should just really get into the habit of checking as you're planning any sort of activity out there. So here is a map of our current wildfire activity. If you've not seen this, um, I'm sorry to say that the Northeast really is getting really attacked by fire at the moment. Uh, my fire center by far in the north is absolutely the busiest. You may have heard of Donny Creek, for example. I'll touch more on it later, but it is certainly a fire of note. But the main thing to get across here is our definitions. I think a lot of people kind of just gloss over this point here. We have a couple of ways to describe the fires that are currently on the landscape, starting in the best way possible. If you don't see it on there or if it's a gray circle, that means it's out. That means the wildfire service and or rain, mother nature, has done their job and we're able to see that this fire is officially out. It no longer poses a threat. Um, the next one up, though, is under control. So for example, looking at the coast, for example, I know there was that fire around the Sea to Sky just outside of West Vancouver. If you were to pull that up right now, you can see that it only got up to about 0.4 hectares, but it is under control. So that means that crews have a handle on it. They feel confident that it's not going to do anything crazy. They're feeling good about it, and they're happy to put that into that status. By contrast, being held means that, well, we're trying our best here. It's not completely under control for this fire, for example, just outside of Cranbrook. They're doing their work. The crews are actively managing this, and they have it in a perimeter of roughly that's going to work for them, but we can't classify it out until certain conditions have been met. So if it's being held, work is being done, but keep in mind that there are still some flare-ups possible with that. Now, unfortunately, as we go beyond that, an out-of-control fire, well, that's not exactly ideal, of course. This is what a lot of fires in my fire center are currently as and it's just because either we just haven't been able to get to it yet or it is burning so intensely that we aren't able to really do anything with it to call it out or being held so always be watching for those that's usually what it will get diagnosed as when the first time it, it comes up on a screen or into our interface system but lastly, our main one is our wildfire of note. Now, these are the wildfires that are highly visible, first of all. So if it's adjacent to a highway, it'll likely be a wildfire of note, or it poses a potential threat to public safety. So the Donny Creek, for example, this one has been going for quite some time now, but it is now 571,000 hectares. That is bigger than PEI uh, for context, and I'll touch more on that in a little bit. But yeah, just get used to playing around on here, and you can even throw on fire perimeters to see which areas have already been burned. And if you see any activity in an area where you're thinking of maybe adventuring or going camping, definitely consider postponing those plans because wildfires can behave erratically. So we want to make sure that everyone is staying essentially as safe as possible. So pivoting through here, if you're not one to use a computer all the time and everything is just kind of on your phone, you can also download the BC Wildfire Service app, which I think is pretty good. I use it myself. It's obviously got its quirks with it. But the main feature on it that I quite love is the fact that there is a near me feature. So it will find your location and let you know, I think it's within a 50 kilometer radius, or maybe it's 25. If there's a fire or some sort of evacuation alert or an order in effect, it'll let you know, you can click on it and learn more information. So I think that's a pretty handy tool, something that you can keep in mind as we go forward. And I promise we're not going to be selling your location data or anything like that. Uh, a slight diversion here, just in terms of checking the forecast, because I know there's a lot of misconceptions, even amongst my own friends and family. They kind of ask me, what does it actually mean when we see a seven-day forecast? Like, how reliable is this? Um, so I took this snapshot a couple of days ago. I think this was on Monday, and this was the forecast for Cranbrook. One of the things that I wanted to mention is that when you see a forecast for today and tomorrow, I can confidently assure you, no matter if you're going through Environment Canada, the Weather Network, your weather app that's default on your phone, 
A human has looked at that and has tried their best to put together a forecast for the next 24 to 48 hours. And yes, that's pretty much it, 48 hours for a human to be looking at it. Anything that falls beyond that, well, that's just a computer that did it. It's taking in raw model data. It's trying its best to give you a picture of the trends that go on. But you and I both know, right? There's not really a lot of reliability here. You've seen that Rick Mercer sketch from this hour's 22 minutes way back in the day about putting a plus one degree at the end of day seven just for kicks. Yeah, it's kind of like that model data is really not that reliable. So when you especially look at what's going on for those last couple of days in the period, say you had, you know, your daughter's birthday coming up and you wanted to be outside in a park, but you're like, oh no, chance for showers on Canada Day. Like maybe we shouldn't do it. Um, I don't really think it's worth worrying about it until it gets into that two to three day range. It will probably change quite a lot as I'm sure you've seen multiple times. So yeah, just be cautious when you're interpreting this. Also, when you see icons, like imagine trying to describe an entire day's weather with an icon. It's a really challenging thing to do. What normally happens for most agencies is they'll pick the most active weather, the most important thing to get across that day. So if there is going to be even the slightest chance of showers or rain, it'll pop up and it will take over the entire icon. But it really doesn't mean all day rain. Even if you are on the coast or you're in the Sunshine Coast, uh, it doesn't rain nonstop all the time. You get those breaks in between. Sometimes it's a little bit of drizzle. It's just trying to hint at what the worst could potentially be. But a note on top, if you've seen that before, that 60% that appears under there, that is a probability of precipitation. The best way to look at it is that it's really just a confidence guess. Basically, how confident is the meteorologist feeling about that 60% or about the weather for that day, I should say. So 60% here does not mean that for, say, the city of Vancouver, that 60% of the city will get rain, while 40% does not. Not at all. That's a common misconception. It really does just mean that there's a 60% chance that you might see some showers today. And that will apply to that very specific area. So if you're looking at a forecast for Vancouver, but you go up to Squamish, those are two very different places. You are not going to necessarily get the same weather conditions there. And to touch on one thing, especially here for the summertime, if you see an icon with a lightning bolt and a shower in the sun, this is kind of like the catch-all icon. This one is actually kind of frustrating from a meteorologist meteorological perspective here, but this is just telling you there's a chance. We are not guaranteeing that there is a thunderstorm today, but you are in an environment where it is conducive to thunderstorm development. So you may see it, you may not. If you're going out golfing that day, for example, and you see there's a chance of thunder showers, well, you might be able to get your round in, but there also may be lightning in the vicinity of the course and you may need to step off of it. That's how it goes. But these thunderstorms are incredibly challenging to pinpoint, so definitely go easy on us. They happen on really, really small scales, but we're just telling you that, hey, there is a chance. So do be aware of that as we go forward. But of course, checking an icon is not necessarily going to give you that whole picture. So two resources for you that I wanted to pass along, and you may know them already, but personally, these are favorites of mine that I use all the time. We have one that is either called the mountain weather forecast or our avalanche forecast in the wintertime. And the other one is windy. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but just rather showing you that when you pull up the mountain weather forecast website in the summertime, what this will do is give you a really good high level meteorological description of what the heck is happening. You may not be interested in all of the jargon there as it's going, for example, um, like meteorologists love to use their terms. And this is just a chart of showing what's happening into the upper atmosphere. But what I would say is really useful on this is if you look at day one, for example, you get these maps on here that kind of just have a few descriptors and images telling you what the heck is going to be going on for that given day. They've even started to throw in now the wildfire danger rating, which I'll touch on a little bit more. But you'll be able to see what's happening from a broader perspective, not just say for the city, but what's happening across the province. This will be really good. It'll even show you the potential here for some thunderstorms for that given day. So if you pulled this up at seven o'clock in the morning, or if you did today, you could see that there was a risk for storms here, say from a hundred mile up to Prince George or even Mackenzie. That one definitely to see it up in the orange category there is a little distressing, <laughs> frankly, that is my fire center and we don't need any more lightning, that's for sure. But yeah, definitely just get into the habit of checking out that. There's quite a lot of cool things on it. I would also mention here from a windy perspective, this is going to be one of the ones if you haven't used it yet. This is going to 
allow you to get a pinpoint forecast for where you're going. So for example, if I were to say, hey, I'm going to go and see what's going on toward Nelson today, beautiful little city down into the Kootenays, but I want to see what's it actually going to be like at the top of this mountain here. I can just click on that one location instead of in town, and I can draw on here. It'll actually tell me what the forecast is for that elevation. So it really takes into account elevation, which is such a key thing for us here in BC. We're blessed with these beautiful mountains. So it will take into account the changes that we can see. But hey, from a forecast perspective here, sunny and pretty warm for the next little while. It's looking like some great hiking conditions there, I could definitely say. So those are just some two resources that I think would be well worth it for you. But I really wanted to bring this all back to how weather and wildfire interact, because as you know, it has already been a pretty record-breaking season, not for everyone, but for a good chunk of our province into the north. It's been quite active. And the reason for that is, as I kind of alluded to, fire certainly cares the most about four weather variables. And as a result, as a forecaster, these these are now the most important ones for me. Understandably, temperature, relative humidity, wind, and precipitation. So it goes without saying, I think we do remember our heat dome that we had tragically at the end of June, about two years ago to the day. In fact, temperatures across BC soared into record breaking territory. Um, we saw temperatures say toward Lytton almost approaching 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, it really was quite a serious issue. And temperature, of course, acts to dry out things. It dries out the ground, it dries out our fuels as it's called, which is all of our vegetation. So the hotter it is, the more likely it is that fires are gonna be a little bit happier in that environment. Relative humidity, think of that of just how dry it is out there. You know, if you try to hang out your clothes in January on a line in Vancouver, you're probably not going to really dry them out all that much. Whereas if you brought those same clothes to Kamloops in July, you could leave them on a line and maybe in 20 minutes, they would be completely dry. So it's just a measure of how dry it is. Certainly the drier it is, the more the fire is going to be happy. Now wind, this is obviously one of the most important ones, if not the most important, and it is quite tricky because winds are very variable. They change. You've seen it, I'm sure, if you've been on a ridge top, how the winds can pick up right there, but in a little valley or a gully, you might not notice any wind at all. So fire always behaves in relation to the wind, whichever direction the wind is blowing from, the fire will blow into that direction. So if it's coming from the west, the fire is going to travel to the east. It usually is about as simple as that. And precipitation, I think, goes without saying. We need that in order to prevent fire uh, from actually going crazy onto the landscape here. And without it, we find ourselves into abnormal drought periods. And that is really the concern for right now. So as I mentioned, fire absolutely loves wind. It loves those dry conditions. We're talking about either vegetation or trees or grass or any combustible material, the drier it is, yeah, the happier that fire is gonna be. But boy, does it not like rain and it doesn't like humidity. So with all of that said, these are just the antecedent conditions for a wildfire. Just because it is hot and dry and windy does not mean a fire is going to start. We need an ignition source. And I wanted to make it quite clear that statistically speaking, 60% of wildfires across the province are lightning caused. So that is terrifying when we do see as many thunderstorms producing lightning as we currently are. It is actually generating quite a lot of um, fires on the landscape. But this also means that 40% of fires are not natural. That means they must be human. And human in this case is not to say that someone is going out there with a lighter or a match and deliberately setting fire to it, though that is technically included in it. It also relates to industry. It also relates to trains, for example, and sparks that can come off of the, um, the wheels as they're going across. And something even as simple as quads. This is one of the things that I wanted to get in mind. A four by four or an ATV or whatever you want to call it, those are actually really concerning from a wildfire perspective. You go through a muddy patch, it'll eventually adhere to the undercarriage of your quad or whatever it is. It'll start to dry out whatever that mud is. And if it's close and in proximity to the muffler, it's possible that that superheated combustible material can get shot out as you're ripping along the trail. And that is enough to spark a fire coming from that hot heated material. So that's really been a concern for us this year. We've had quite a few incidents of people just on their ATVs not even noticing that that's how some of those fires were started. So do be mindful. And of course, you know, the common trope, don't flick a cigarette butt out of your window as you're driving. I think we all get that. The percentage of those incidents is fortunately quite low now. And of course, if you're going out camping, making triple sure that not even the fire is out, but those embers are cool to the touch. If you want to know more about our variables here, you can click on this other link here. This is for our BC wildfire fire weather maps, which you can bring up here. It'll just show you what it's been looking like over the past day, how many areas of the province 
province have seen precipitation. You can see, for example, Vancouver Island and the coast, really quite dry, have not seen some precipitation today. It's also been quite dry into the Okanagan with our relative humidity where it is, and you can see where our winds and temperatures are. So that's only if you really want to nerd out. Do not feel any pressure to do so. You can let the forecasters kind of take care of that, as it were. But getting on to the point here of weather and wildfire and our danger rating. So this is something that I think really needs to be kind of always ingested into your plans. If you are going to be going out into the backcountry in an area with high to extreme fire danger, be extra cautious. You should also very much check to see if there are any prohibitions, for example, on whether or not you can even have a campfire. It's going to vary from run one region to the next. But I wanted to show you on this map here, first of all, the colors. These represent our different categories. The highest shade of red here, that is for our extreme danger. That means that everything is primed and ready to go. A fire would have no difficulty at all in getting going. If it's high, yeah, it's probably going to respond well to that, and it will certainly get going for for sure, but just a little bit less confident on how it's going to behave. And if you find yourself in that moderate to low category, that's promising. That means you probably got a little bit of precipitation recently and something to keep in mind as you're going out there, that's probably going to be all right. But you can click on that fire danger rating link that I put up there. And one of the things I just wanted to really mention here, if you see all of these black dots, if you've ever been curious what those are, those represent an individual weather station that the BC Wildfire Service maintains. So what we do is collect data from each one of these weather stations and we form an amalgamated map based on what are called the indices, how it receptive is that ground to catching on fire. So we put it all together and then the map generates every day right around, I would say between one and two o'clock Pacific time. And it should be published and available for public viewing, usually by about 2.30 each day. So definitely keep track of that, watch to see how it changes. And you're really just hoping for a whole lot of rain falling over one station or your neck of the woods in order to bring that wildfire danger a little bit more down. So that's kind of what we're going for there. But yeah, what I wanted to bring your attention to was just kind of the state of where we're in right now. So in terms of 2023, this has already been off to a pretty impressive start. And I don't like to use impressive because it is impressive, but it's also just heartbreaking, frankly. Uh, the amount of smoke that's already been emitted this year, the effect that that can have on your own personal well-being, your own physical health, uh, is really quite unfortunate. And this year, especially into the northeast portion of BC, we started the year off early. It was around May 3rd, where we got our very first wildfire that was responding to these incredibly dry conditions that we've had. And I'll talk more about this little image in a second, but I wanted to kind of make it really clear. There is a very valid reason for why we're seeing our heightened fire activity right now. If you may recall, last October, right around Thanksgiving, we had one of the craziest droughts and sort of extended summers that we've ever really seen here in BC. It kept us so hot and dry that wildfires were burning up north until the end of October. For reference, we start to wind down usually in the north by early September around Labor Day. And here I was briefing until well after Thanksgiving. So we left the fall in a very dry state, then everything froze over. So no moisture can actually seep into the ground once it's frozen over. And then we started off spring with a deficit in terms of the precipitation that fell across our province and especially across the Northeast. So when we took a look at our conditions at the beginning of April and May, we were terrified we were seeing wildfire conditions that were basically analogous to what we would be expecting in June or July. We were about two to three months ahead of schedule. So when you include now just a little bit of lightning or any of those quads or anyone that's actually ripping around and causing human caused fires, it had basically primed the landscape for rapid and explosive fire growth. This day in particular, this was May 15th. I remember it vividly. What you've been looking at the whole time is a visible satellite image of smoke rapidly descending sending from the north to the south, all thanks to a cold front that was going across. Now, a cold front is just a really cold mass of air that's being pushed along by natural physics, I guess. But what happened that day, I was personally driving from Fort Nelson. I was up there for work and driving down to Fort St. John. And I remember finishing my weather briefing and saying, I have to get on the road now <laughs> because I need to get to Fort St. John before this cold front arrives. There was this fire on the landscape that we didn't know too much about, but we figured yeah, there was a chance that it might actually get going pretty well. And if I show you here, this was kind of what it looked like once I made it to Fort St. John. This was what was actually called the Stoddart Creek wildfire, really bubbling up and responding to those strong winds. But for the first time, 
I actually got a notification on my phone. It was an emergency alert and it told me to evacuate immediately. I work for the wildfire service and my stomach still lurched. I was terrified because I had just driven through a section that was put on an emergency evacuation order, not just an alert, not just saying that, hey, you should probably be aware that a fire may be coming soon, but rather get out now and leave. And that was a really humbling experience because I realized just how quickly conditions can change. And even though I'm in the industry, it still took me by surprise that we suddenly got this issued. But turns out that fire really responded to those that cold front, it generated a lot of strong winds and it allowed that fire to really start to bubble up and grow. So if you do ever find yourself in a situation where you get that notification on your phone, it is not a test. Absolutely, it is not. You need to take that to heart. It is going to be terrifying in the moment, but it should have the information on there that you need to follow. And just do that. Do what it says. In this case, it said, hey, go down to Dawson Creek. That's going to be an area of safety for you. Get there as soon as you can. And a lot of people did. So it really did work its magic. But over the course of this spring, we have really seen really in extended dry conditions here across the far north and east. Many other parts of the province I haven't touched on yet because the wildfire season is still to come. We're just gearing up for those in the south. So in the Okanagan, in the southeast, and even along the coast, usually late June, July, and August, that's the time where those fires start to get going. So we've had continued hot and dry conditions into the northeast, and you can see my fire center here, the Prince George Fire Center, 204 fires. Yeah, it's been really busy. And why? Well, over that past weekend, that we just had, we got 11,000 lightning strikes from thunderstorms that were going through. So it really brought up a lot of activity and we are still gonna find those fires as time goes on. But you'll note that for other places, you know, the Northwest, for example, they tend to be a little bit cooler, a little bit more humid, say, especially toward Prince Rupert and even over toward Terrace. They don't normally get really, really active just yet. But other places like Kamloops along the coast into the Caribou, Williams Lake, 100 Mile, down to the Southeast, that time is yet to come. There is still going to be a lot of activity expected. But just to show you some of the stats here, I don't know if normally people are interested in stats, but this one really kind of stands out to me because if you look at what's been going on this year, BC has now had 573 fires as of today. And if you look at how much has burnt in total, that is 962,000 hectares. Now for reference, because I had to look this up, I didn't even, I couldn't compute really how much that was. The entire landmass of Haida Gwaii off the coast of BC there, that is about a million hectares. So we're essentially looking at the entire landmass of Haida Gwaii having burnt so far, and we are not even into July yet. But if you look at this, what I think is the most terrifying is that from my fire center in the PG zone and PG fire center, 950,000 hectares have burnt. <laughs> so I think it's a little bit lopsided here. Yeah, would you say? We really haven't seen a lot of activity elsewhere in the province. Thank goodness. I know down toward the south where there are certainly more people living. You don't want those fires. You don't want the smoke. Of course not. But it really has been one-sided. And Donnie Creek, as I mentioned, this is the largest fire right now, 571,000 hectares. It is officially bigger than PEI. And it is not quitting anytime soon. It is very likely that this will be continuing not only just through the summer, but into the fall and actually over winter. It can actually burn underground, even if there's snow on top. It is pretty, pretty terrifying. Now, if you want to see those stats for yourself, you are more than welcome to. You just have to click on that link, uh, which I didn't actually pull up here, but just click on the link there and it will actually bring you to where that ends up being. You can count all of the numbers for yourself if you would really like. So with that said, I'm going to go back here and just show you a couple of more things really from a safety perspective, because at this point, I think it's understood that my role is to try to keep people as safe as I possibly can, but it falls on you to also so be prepared and be ready for rapidly changing conditions. So in the industry, we talk about prevention and preparedness as being really our main key things. So one of the things that we have put together is a wildfire preparedness guide. And this is something that you can click on. This is another link that I do actually have <laughs> put up this time here, but it is a PDF and it talks about all of the things that you can be doing to help yourself through this upcoming wildfire season. So what can you do to prevent your property or your area from catching on fire? What do you do in the case that maybe you get one of those evacuation alerts on your phone or evacuation order? What is a grab and go bag? Have you considered putting this together? Do you have a kit that you would be able to rely on for at least 48 hours? It's all in there. It's going to be really useful for you. I would highly recommend that you take a peek at that. 
And I do want to mention that for me personally, this is one of those things. I may be living down in the Southeast, but my mind is very focused on what's going on up North. And I got a text mid shift from a friend of mine who was like, Hey, by the way, you probably know this, but there's a fire like three minutes down the road from you. Do you know anything about it? And I was shocked. I was actually caught off guard. It had just rained like a day before. I wasn't even thinking about it. And sure enough, I threw up the map and there was a fire within a three minute drive of where I live. And suddenly it dawned on me that even me, the one preaching this message right now to have a grab and go bag ready, I didn't. I had just figured that because it was raining, I wouldn't need to do that just yet. And my heart sank. I got really quite scared, called up my colleagues. I wanted to know what the status was. I had those connections to be able to see how it was. And it turns out they were going to action it as quickly as possible. But it was a very rude awakening for me to realize that it's like, no, no, this bag needs to be in your front closet or by your front door, ready to go at a moment's notice. Because even if you don't think that it's going to happen to you, it just might. So keep that in mind as we go forward here. I've mentioned about that app just to use that near me feature will certainly help you to identify when things are going to be coming your way. Um, and really to stress on the point here, take evacuation alerts and orders seriously. These are not put together lightly. I'm going to be fully transparent here. <laughs> Thank you, updates. Um, fully transparent that when we have to consider putting a community or an area on evacuation alert or order, we do not want to. That is not what we're out there for. We don't want to cause disruptions, but we recognize that there is a threat to human life. So we actually are working in conjunction with the municipalities, with the RCMP, with all of the authorities that put out those evacuation alerts and orders. We do not have the authority to do that ourselves. It needs to come from the regional district, but they consult with us. So an alert to keep in mind, if you are placed on alert, that means absolutely have that bag ready to go and be prepared for something to change at a moment's notice. It is not a guarantee that you're going to have to leave, but conditions are favorable for that fire to potentially grow in your general direction. But the second that you get an order, that is when things change. That is you grabbing that bag, grabbing the kids, the pets, whatever you may have, your important documents, and you are leaving. You are driving out, you're getting out as fast as you possibly can. It means that it's imminent. Now, some people choose to stay home and they choose to fight the fire themselves. I guess technically you can do that. We're not going to persecute you for doing that, but we also can't offer you resources if you stay put. So that's the trade-off. If you do follow the evacuation orders, we can help you get to where you need to be safely. But if you stay home, you are really on your own and you are endangering yourself. So keep that in mind, always do your own thing. <laughs> but anyways, definitely leave if you possibly can. So yeah, we have an also in a last minute evacuation checklist because guaranteed if you get that order coming to your phone or you find it out, it's gonna cause a little bit of panic. You will try to think of, oh my gosh, what do I actually do? So we do have a document available for that as well. It'll help you to keep a little bit more calm throughout that situation, just a couple of things to check off and hopefully allow you to feel like you can do the right thing and leave and make sure that you're not forgetting something absolutely crucial or important. But the main thing here, I think for all of us as keen adventurers, as we love to do, you do definitely need to be prepared to cancel or postpone your trip. Even if you've been planning it for months, I know how hard it is to reserve a campsite in this province. We have so many beautiful places to go. Or even if you've just booked a hut, or if you're out there and thinking that, yeah, I got this week off work, it's the only one I have, I'm going, it's going to work. Well, unfortunately, wildfire doesn't care about your week of vacation. Sometimes it can ruin your plans. I've had my own be completely thrown to the wind because conditions completely changed. So just be prepared to pivot on a dime. And the main thing here, I think you should hopefully know this now from a messaging standpoint, but even if you think you're just observing smoke or maybe it might not even be smoke, doesn't matter. We want to hear about it. And don't play the game of, well, I'm sure someone else is going to do it because we all do that. If you're on a highway and you think that you see something off in the distance and you assume that that person behind you or someone else is going to phone in, maybe they don't. <laughs> maybe we all just don't hear about it. But the second that you dial star 5555 on your phone, wherever you happen to be, if you have service, that will connect you with the dispatcher headquartered in Victoria. 
you will tell them where you are and they will connect you to the appropriate dispatching fire center. So if that's in the Northeast, for example, that would be in Prince George. If you're down in the Southeast, that would be in Castlegar. Um, so keep that as something in the back of your mind. If you even think of seeing something, rest assured if they get so many calls that they say, hey, yeah, are you talking about this fire beside Harris Lake? They'd be like, yeah, that one. They're like, great, we have it. Thank you so much. We're good to go. That's the worst that they're going to do. They're not going to be mad. They want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. So please feel free to put that in there all the time. It definitely helps us all out. Now that said, if you do have any additional questions or if you do want to reach out to me directly or get some more information that I might not be able to answer in the question period coming up, here's how you can reach me. You can just, it's brett.solderhome at gov.bc.ca. You can do that at any time, but keep in mind, yes, wildfire season is certainly a busy time of year. We'll try my best to respond and prioritize essentially as best I can. But I really just wanna emphasize that staying safe and taking all of these pieces together at heart, probably gonna be the best course of action that you can take to enjoy this upcoming summer ahead. So I'm gonna end my slideshow and let's see if this ends up working. I can just go back on to sharing my screen here or just myself. <laughs> um, do, do, do. Yeah, I think it's still probably sharing my screen. Give me. I'll one. knock you out. Okay. No problem. Oh, stop share. There we go. We did it. <laughs> Take some time. Marvelous. Well, I, there was some questions in the Q and A, and I had some questions of my own. But okay. uh, apparently, someone heard that hit a bird hitting an electrical transformer, and what they said was getting fried, <laughs> and then hitting the ground is classified as human caused. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, I that would be true. I think technically it would have to. And the reason being is because we only have one category for lightning. If it is not lightning, then it's going to have to go into our other category of human okay. caused or um, undetermined, I think is one that can pop up. So in the case of that bird, we would probably put that at undetermined because we don't think that someone deliberately did that to the bird. But, you know, <laughs> it, it's not lightning, essentially, is where that comes from. That's that's a good point. And let's hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> what are some of the other uh, other ways uh, of human caused? Because uh, during the uh, Alberta election, people were saying, oh, there's all sorts of arsonists going out and they lit the thousand fires in the north part of uh, Alberta. Um, I, I don't think you're going to light a hundred fires at once. Like that's a lot of quick. I can't even get like 10 people to uh, come to a, 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 a party for me uh, uh, and, and, and have them all show up. That's exactly. never going to happen, right? No, I know. <laughs> like, at work, I can't have all of the people who are supposed to attend an important meeting attend. Yeah. How are you going to get 100 people to get up to the top of the thing? So uh, oh, yeah. what what are the different ways that we classify as human caused uh, yeah. versus lightning? Yeah, so basically pretty well anything that remotely had to do that was not lightning would fall under human cause. But for an example, so I talked about the quads, like our ATVs, for sure, that's going to be a big one. You know, campfires escaping their perimeter, of course, cigarette butts thrown out there. But also I wanted to mention that, especially on rural properties, uh, people can get permits to burn uh, their material. They have to keep their area fire safe and you have to apply for these permits. But for example, in McBride this year, uh, one gentleman just didn't monitor his little pile and a gust of wind came up and it absolutely created an entire fire that was going all the way through town. Uh, so industry operations, that's a main one. So if someone is out there cutting down a tree, falling a tree, as it were, sparks can come from that chainsaw and it could potentially land in a very dry area as well. Um, I mentioned about sort of like trains and machinery and basically anything that's really heavy and metallic and generates a lot of heat. Those are going to be human caused too. And even something, this is the wild part, even if a tree by itself got gusted over by a gust of wind and landed on a power line and that power line ended up causing a short and started a fire that would also be human cost so even okay. though if it was just the tree doing it it still technically was a power line that is human infrastructure so we have to kind of put it into that category gotcha. um, but to your point scott for sure for all of those that have been thinking that oh wow this must just be a conspiracy for all of these fires to just start automatically all at the same time no no we can't get 100 people to attend a zoom meeting let alone climb to the rib tops of mountains that are completely inaccessible so yeah that's just a little bit out the window <laughs> uh, why is it uh, why does it seem that there's way more fire this season than last season? Like, it, it, like I said, there were conspiracy theories saying it's about an election. It's all about this stuff. You mentioned that 
the uh, you had a freeze before the water was able to sink into the into the thing what's the consequence of that for your yeah. northeast fire center like what are the things that make it blow up up there yeah absolutely so it is a combination of two things for sure and to be really quite clear about this you're absolutely right if you've been thinking this season has already been just so completely abnormal and just unreal absolutely i have been only in the wildfire service for three years but those that have been working for 37 have never seen a season like this so i just want you to keep that in mind people that have had decades of experience have not experienced something like this so far but yes absolutely we finished off in a drought when we get that layer of ice or that ground freezes over it creates almost like you know it's like the hood of your car it's creating a barrier from any snow or melt water to actually make it into the ground and so by the time that that snow melts when the sun comes out it actually just sublimates the snow. It doesn't even turn it into liquid. It evaporates it and doesn't allow it to seep in. So it set the ground truly at a stage here that is quite dry. But the reason the Northeast in particular is one of the regions that's seeing such activity comes down to its fuel type. And I didn't touch on this because I thought maybe some people might glaze over a bit here, but a fuel type is how we would classify the type of vegetation or trees that we have in a given part of the province. So down here in the Kootenays, for example, we have these beautiful ponderosa Pines. These trees were built for fire. They're the ones that are giant. They've got their pine cones up at the really high top of their trees. And when the fire actually comes, that's their signal to release pine cones. And it's a completely natural process. In the Northeast, we have trees that are called boreal spruce. And if you're from, say, the Northern Prairies, if you've been in Ontario and you know what the boreal forest is, that spruce tree is incredibly flammable. It has resin and oil in it that basically explodes when it gets heated. So as that tree catches fire, it's exploding outward, causing more trees to catch fire, exploding outward and going and going. And that's why Donnie Creek right now has just grown to the size of PEI. It has unlimited coniferous trees to be burning through up there, that black spruce. It is absolutely loving eating all that up. It is terrible for us and it really is heartbreaking to see, but especially in the Northeast, that's it. Our fuel type there is what really does it in the end. Do... I, I know prognostication is not is only part of your job, mm -hmm. but do does the wildfire service think that there's going to be any way to control Donny Creek, or are they just waiting until we get to November and it ends? <laughs> Yeah, I laugh here because it's an absolutely valid question. And I would love to say that, yes, we're going to be able to get it under control. It is now so big that I don't think that is ever going to happen this season, frankly. What we're doing and what we're prioritizing as an agency is making sure that our most concerning perimeters of that fire, say close to the Alaska Highway on the west side or that southern border closer to where towns and communities are to Prince, uh, sorry, to Port St. John, those are the most actively daily managed portions of that fire. But to get to the point where they be able to say that it's being held i think honestly that would take a lot more resources than we actually even have available so they're going to do their best to make sure that we are keeping it away from all of our values at risk but sadly if it's just going off to the east we do have oil and gas don't get me wrong and there are some first nations communities that have been put on evacuation order or alert um, but for major population centers we're really protecting that sort of southern and western boundary the um once the rains do hit in November, hopefully they do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, how long is it going to take for it to go out? Like, what? Yeah. Like, is this something that will potentially continue until it's? covered in five feet of snow? Will it continue past five feet of snow? I, I, yeah, I, what's going to be terrifying here is that it sounds like a joke, but actually, yes, it is very likely that based on its size right now and its self-sustaining nature, not only is this fire going to continue the whole season, it will continue into the fall, it'll continue over winter, and already the concern is that this is likely to come back to haunt us in 2024. It is that big and self-sustaining. So you're going to be pretty bored of hearing about Donny Creek, I think, for quite some time. Um, so Certainly for me, it's like, oh, wow, I'm still forecasting for this. Yes, again, <laughs> every day for the rest of my life, apparently. Not to make light of it, it is, of course, a very serious situation. But yeah, frankly, it is such a beast that barring some crazy atmospheric river coming in September, which doesn't even happen up there, but they would need to get like hundreds of millimeters of rain consecutively for days on end in order to put that thing out. It's just not going to happen, likely. Wow. Yeah. Uh that's scary. And and to think it would go over winter, I guess that's because uh, uh, the, the roots and such can keep the fire going. 
Exactly. There's just enough organic material in the ground and just enough oxygen for that fuel or for the fire to smolder. And then the second that it's able to kind of like peek up out through the snow and get into fresh oxygen, that's when it's going to come back and flare. And for the record, we have seen this with Battleship Mountain. If anyone knows about that fire that was over toward Chetwind last year, uh, Hudson Hope area, that was a big wildfire for us. Uh, that did come back already this spring. We thought it was out, but then it continued to burn over the winter time and we had to reaction that again the spring so yeah it's going to be busy for quite some time uh, another person asked and it's a good question why did they just announced a campfire ban in the coastal fire series, but it, uh, center but they didn't make it for the lower mainland so why mm -hmm. like why did they decide or how did they decide is it probably a better way when they should have a campfire ban uh, because i think people in addition to it being a campfire ban mm -hmm. which is means a, a very specific legal thing. I think it's also a trigger in people's heads to think things are really bad now. So I have to start thinking about other things like yeah. uh, maybe I should stay still while smoking or I don't go <laughs> uh, like you shouldn't be doing that stuff anyway. You should be staying still smoking anyway and you should be putting <laughs> your, your your stuff out. But uh, uh, in, in, on a rock and then taking the butt and putting it in, in a, a little container. But mm -hmm. uh, why how do they make those decisions because i know there's a uh, there's a lot of criticism that they don't do it fast enough and then yep. there's criticism why in the world can't i have a campfire when it just rained yesterday for oh, 10 minutes <laughs> how's the how's those decisions made Yes. So I will, for full transparency, you're not going to like my answer here is that that is unfortunately not something that I ever am a part of. I just give sure. what the weather is and then people, the powers that be taken into account. However, from my experience, when I mentioned about our fire danger rating map, as soon as it reaches a level where we get to either higher extreme, the agency or the fire center needs to consider whether or not it's going to be useful or prudent to put on a ban. It's a preventative measure and will almost certainly come out right around the long weekend. If you happen to notice the timing, <laughs> it's when we know that people are going outside en masse to go and have campfires and to enjoy that time. So we're kind of stuck because we don't want to cancel everyone's fun, but we also want to limit the amount that has the potential for another bit of hazard to come our way. So it's this tricky balance. So in this case, as to why not the lower mainland, I honestly couldn't tell you. My guess is, is that just based on population and the way that there isn't as much area to technically burn in the lower mainland compared to to say going up the sea to sky they said maybe that had something to do with it but i would be speaking out of turn i don't and i don't we did have rain recently right. and you did have rain so yeah that could so. have had something to do with it as well but rest assured it's not something that we want to do nobody wants to say no you can't have fires because we know that such an integral part of camping is so fun uh, but sadly it is a preventative measure especially along long weekends to make sure that uh, we try to minimize the amount that could go wrong essentially uh, now, you mentioned that 60% is done by uh, lightning and 40% yep. is done by non-lightning. <laughs> yep. uh, and th there's actually not a lot that are set by the flicking of the of the yeah. uh, of the things. Are there very many set by campfires? Like I do know, I I, I used to work in a provincial park in Northern Ontario, and it mm -hmm. was someone uh, yeah. that got, it caught on fire, and it was because someone actually left their campfire unattended. Yeah. So it does happen, but it does uh, happen. is it happening frequently? It would be hard to generalize as a, like, I couldn't just give you a percentage off the top of my head. It's enough for us to still keep that messaging going. Um, yeah. However, I think it's just one of those things when you think of, say, like Smokey the Bear, we now have like Ember, the Firefox instead. Uh, we don't even have Smokey the Bear telling you to only you can prevent fire uh, forest fires. Um, but really, it is a concern for sure. Like if you, it does happen. I've myself seen it even in an area in the Northeast where I happen to be. So it does happen, but hopefully I think it is less common than it used to be. The messaging really has started to get a little bit more clear for people. But that said, it, no matter what the stat is, please just, just keep putting it out. Keep adding that extra bucket of water on there, even if you think it's done. And before you leave, do it again. Like really, I just can't stress enough. Minimize the amount of hazard at all costs, essentially. When I was a uh, Cub Scout leader, I would have the Cubs build their own fires. And then the last thing they would do is they would put pour the fire on and then they'd use a stick to stir it. And then they pour the, the water, oh, sorry, pour the water on. Yeah. Uh, and then they stir the stick and then they pour the water on and then they'd stir the stick. Perfect. And we would get to a point where you put your hand and yep. you can break your hand through all the coals and it's perfectly cold. Exactly. And if you feel you can't do that, yeah, then it's... just add more water. 
Exactly. <laughs> it really is as simple as that. And also don't think that sand is just going to put it out either. That doesn't yeah. actually work all the time. <laughs> it's, it may reduce the flames, but it's keeping the embers quite hot. So yeah, your method there, absolutely spot on. Uh, one person was asking the northeast corner of Prince George district region, there's a polygon that was represented on the map. Was that Donny Creek? Is that what we're seeing the, uh, on, the, on the map or is there something else? That's up there? Yeah. So I'm just going to, cause it could have been one of two things. If it was a polygon that looked like, uh, if it was shaded here, I'm going to just share my screen again, sure. just so we can uh, do this, make sure that I actually do it properly this time. I think we should be all right. So I'm just curious if it was in relation. So this is a fire perimeter outlined in red here, but then if you okay. see these polygons, these are actual areas that have been placed under alert or order. Ah. So these are coming from the Peace Regional, Regional District right here. Those are saying that if you happen to find yourself in that area, you are under an evacuation alert. And for example, in this very far northern section here, this is actually an evacuation order. So it'll show up as red. So this fire has experienced quite a lot of growth. And that was issued by the Northern Rockies Regional Municipality, basically saying, get out of Dodge, so to say, get out there as quickly as you can. I'm sorry that I missed that because that really was supposed to be a key thing that I talked about on here those polygons thank you for that question 100 percent, very good <laughs> uh one other thing so we talked about the ev evacuation list and yeah. you said uh, it, there was an evacuation that brought you that that would bring you down to dawson creek for instance yeah uh what is in dawson creek like what are people expect what 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 oh. is what are people expecting when they get there yeah are they just going to drive down there <laughs> no. and it's like welcome to dawson creek yeah, the welcome party is right on the highway for you yeah. and you get no. Actually, so funny. And I mean, we're, I don't want to get too late for time here. But so what ended up being uh, their order, once you got that order, you were directed to go to their inner care center, which is basically like a huge arena that they have okay. in Dawson Creek. That's where they put up all of um, basically all of the information that you would need. You would get a little care package. They would give you hotel vouchers so that you could go and spend the night in a neighboring hotel. Um, they either gave you food vouchers or there was actually food to be had there. Um, there was a bunch of water. There were things to help you take care of your pets. I know they had extra diapers, for example, for babies and things. So basically just follow those directions. It was a check-in. They want to make sure if you're ever placed under an order, go to that check-in facility. Once you're registered with them, they will keep giving you updates automatically as to when it's going to be safe for you to go. It'll also okay. keep tabs on your whereabouts. And that is so helpful for us from an organizational perspective, but especially for you, it's worth waiting in line for those five to 10 minutes and maybe stress but it is absolutely worth doing that yeah i think they also have resources to help you uh, like if you can't figure out uh, uh, how to get in touch with your insurance and stuff like that they can exactly help you with that yeah too, right? they have people like basically trained in emergency response that can basically do all of that for you and yeah they'll help you and be very sympathetic and treat you as calmly and respectfully as they can last question mm -hmm. uh and it's a great question how is the fire area actually mapped like hmm. do you use drones do you use uh, 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 like is a person dry, uh, uh, looking out the window of an airplane and and, and doing it like <laughs> are you using satellites to map the, yeah. the where the where the fire is how does it do that <laughs> i love this question absolutely and thank you that you get to allow me to nerd out with this one for sure so it will go through various stages so first of all the main thing that we use largely is a satellite heat signature so every day we have a website that allows us to see it's a satellite that can pick up on hot spots across the province. Uh, this allows us to be like, hmm, there's a little hot spot here. We saw lightning there yesterday. Maybe that's something that we should look at. It will then allow us to go and investigate and we'll be able to go and see. And if there is something there, it's actually ridiculous. But the first preliminary estimate is by flying around in a helicopter, keeping track of the coordinates of that path that was flown, and then converting that into a Google Earth file. And that's going to be our preliminary look at it. But as really? the fire gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we can eventually use what's called high level scanning. So we can use airplanes or we can use a very drones are absolutely a thing that we can use. And it will be able to more accurately detect how far that fire has gone. So when you're looking at the size of a fire, if you notice that it hasn't changed for three days, for example, I assure you it has. We just haven't <laughs> had the chance to run one of those scans because it's in okay. a high demand. But yeah. Yeah, that's when it really gets to be important trying to make it as accurate as possible so, so it's you're, a li you're literally things. going around the edge of it with a, a, a airplane that has a gps on it and then yep. you take all the coordinates that that gps has done and you throw it in a kml wow. file and it throws into 
Google. Yeah. It. Yeah. It's and so amazing. that's why sometimes we don't have enough resources to do that. We have other things that happen to be going sure. on, but when the fire is really particularly of note, they have a dedicated person to go and do that. And those high level scans, they give us such beautiful, but terrifying imagery of what it's actually looking like in real time. And we convert that into data that then is made available to the public. Amazing. Yeah. I think we're out of questions for today, but I, I, I know Sandra had a couple of things she wanted to get to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I do. And, you know, I think as we wrap up, I just like to look you straight in the eye, Brett, and say thank you. From our team here at BC Adventure Smart, from our team here at the BC Search and Rescue Association, we, we couldn't be more grateful to have you back again. And I would love to invite you again and again and again. <laughs> uh, the, to me, this was a, just a surface because I can feel your energy through the screen from miles and miles away, what you bring. And you say nerd out, I say enthusiastic, <laughs> entertaining, <Wow. laughs> educational, engaging, you know, and, and really that's how we can learn even better. So, you know, big hugs and thank well. you for being a part of our summer series and, and taking part in what we do here. You know, for those who have stuck around, I'd love to offer a prize to a lucky winner. And here's where I get to, pick out something out of Brett's uh, presentation to ask a question. So Scott, our tech support, will pick the first winner, uh, first person that answers this question. And I'm sure you were all listening as, as intently as I was to the presentation. Uh, and so the question is, so the quickly, the quickest person to type in the answer, okay, Scott says put your answer in the chat. Uh, this question will win a wonderful prize from our sponsor tonight, which is Bright Source, and it's a folding pocket slim light. It's really cool. It's awesome. And we will arrange the shipment of that. So Scott will collect your email. So the question is, Brett mentioned two amazing, awesome apps this evening, and I would like you to tell me what both of those are. The first person to give me both of those apps in your answer will win this prize once Scott tells us who the first person that answered it correctly is. Oh, look at all the answers coming in. I love it. That's very There fine. we go. There, it was quite particular. It was quite particular because uh, uh, Brett gave us two really great examples of resources. And I picked this question because we're always asking you to trip plan. And to me, that just rang a big bell of here you can go, here where you can find this great information. And thanks for those demos as well. So we are fortunate enough to have Jeannie who came out first. One was Windy, the windy.com app. And of course, the other one is a BC Wildfire app that you can put on your phone. Those are two of the apps that were mentioned in the, uh, during the session today. Perfect. Well done. Very good. <laughs> well done is right. Well, I see we've gone over time. So I appreciate everyone's time tonight and, and sticking around with us and for everyone's energy and attention to taking some time to get informed before we all head out there. I know all of us who are sitting here tonight love the outdoors in some shape or form. If it's camping like Scott does every weekend, uh, if it's enjoying the outdoors like Brett does, if it's mountain biking like myself, I'm sure you have a favorite as well. And as we close tonight, thank you very much. Join us for the future webinars. We have a few more to go this summer. You can find them on our BC Search and Rescue Association Outdoor Education Events page. You can also find it on the Adventure Smart website. You can follow us on our socials. It's very active. We keep you tuned in there. Uh, Scott, thank you for your time tonight. Brett, lovely and appreciate all your efforts. Good luck this summer. Thank you for spending some of your days off with us. Well, thank you and, so much for having me. <laughs> and on behalf of the 3,400 Search and Rescue volunteers in the province of BC, thank you for getting informed and have a safe summer ahead. Good night. Good night, folks.